Made in Latin America. 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 Latin America. Welcome to Made in Latin America, a new podcast brought to you by the Santo Domingo Centre of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum. In this podcast, you'll be listening to insights and interpretations about iconic collections at the British Museum, as well as examples from the more than 60,000 items, of which many have never been on display. Join us in this series that will deepen and challenge what you know about Latin America. This season explores the Tolimteya Codex, one of the few surviving pre-Hispanic pictorial manuscripts made more than 500 years ago in the Mystic region in Mexico. In which language is it written? Why is its blue color so unique? What stories does it tell? The podcast will be hosted by two curators from the Latin America Center, Laura Osorio Sonax and Maria Mercedes Martinez Milanchi. Indigenous researchers, communities, and artists working with this codex will join us throughout the season. Hi, everybody. This is Mercedes and Laura from the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research here at the British Museum, and welcome to the Made in Latin America podcast. Today, we'll be talking about Maya Blue, a special pigment used in the Toninde Codex. It not only has a beautiful color, but also has fascinating chemical properties that has made it particularly resistant through time. Just to remind you how it's going to work, me and Laura are going to have a conversation, and then we'll have some comments from different specialists. And throughout the episode, you'll be listening to a creative retelling of the Toninde Codex, read by Miguel Villa. There has been a death. The little Lord Turbain, ruler of New Gno, lies poisoned. He set out on an ecstatic voyage to access divine wisdom, but he did not return alive. And though a little Lord, no little matter, for this is Jaguar Claw's moment to gain the throne of his ancestral homeland. No longer a far-off collector of coastal towns, he could be a player in a bigger game. Is the prince's death suspicious? Perhaps. Is Jawa Claw the greatest beneficiary? Perhaps. Was he involved in the boy King's demise? It would be unwise to speculate if you value your skin's unconscious surface. To snatch this moment, to gain and sustain his throne, Lord Eight Deer, born of non-royal stock, needs prestige and validation. And the quickest way to climb that slippery stair is by rope hitch to someone already above it. First divine assistance sought, precious offering and spiritual pilgrimage to Goddess Lady Nine Reed, deity of Blood Town, on the day Nine Serpent. Nine, symbol of death. Snake, symbol of venom death and venom so soon after Prince lies dead to poison him. A message writes in the calendar. And in exchange for precious gifts given, he asks of Lady Nine Reed to be his rope, his link to tie him to a stronger man. In the past few episodes, we've been talking about the Doninaya Codex and the people of Nusawi and the language that's used in the Codex. Fundamentally, the Codex at the end of the day is, is a work of art, right? And so in this work of art, there is a lot of what's called Maya Blue. This episode, we're focusing on the pigment Maya Blue. As a material, Maya blue is incredibly exciting to a colour scientist and chemist like me. Joanne Dyer, resident colour scientist at the British Museum, used a variety of scientific methodologies to decipher the process behind pigment making and also the mystery behind its durability. It's a true hybrid made up of an inorganic component, the microfibrous clay palygorskite, whose nanostructure provides little channels for an organic component, the dark blue indigo dye, to sit in, giving this wonderful and totally unique blue colour and an incredibly durable pigment. So Laura, can you describe the colour of Maya Blue? And could you describe maybe some instances in the codex or characters in the codex or pictographs in the codex that have the blue? I can describe the colour and it's it's quite hard to do, but it has a very, very particular uh, sort of colour property, I think. And that's why one of the reasons why everyone uh, loves it. But it's got this kind of very bright blue green. So it's almost like a turquoise, but it's but it's got a very sort of good intensity and brightness. 
So when it comes to uh, the Codex and its relationship with Maya Blue, there's Maya Blue in, in you know, in lots of different places uh, in in the way that the drawings happen. So there isn't actually a relationship in the case of the Codex between this very sort of semantically important colour and only certain important precious things actually it's there's there's Maya blue in a lot of a lot of this codex um but there is one small exception which is the little symbol that denotes uh jaguar claw um it is a turquoise dot with a little claw coming out of it and i think that it could be the case and this is conjecture it could be the case that the artist used turquoise to denote the importance of this person uh, and the sort of preciousness of this of this new name, but we can we can imagine that uh, Maya Blue is associated with a certain idea, and turquoise and jade, which are also in the blue and green range, were also accorded this sort of special status of kind of privileged colours, privileged materials. And and so, do you think like Maya Blue was considered like a luxury good? Yes. Um, I don't know about luxury. Luxury is a really hard word, isn't it? Because it, it implies all kinds of strange capitalistic uh, frameworks. But I think that it was found on a lot of what we think might have been in ritual spaces and on ritual uh, artifacts. Again, what do we see in the archaeological record? It's often things that were, you know, buried for funeral purposes or, you know, they're in temple structures or things like this because they're precious. And so to some extent, it's maybe possible that Maya Blue was used for non-ritual reasons, but the archaeological record would point to the fact that it was used in that kind of context. And why has this blue been called Maya Blue instead of like Mishtek Blue or Mesoamerican Blue since it's found in, in other cultures, um, cultural material? Yeah, you just hit the nail on the head, really. Yeah, everyone calls it Maya Blue. It's so called Maya Blue to specialists. <laughs> um, it is on, there's there's examples of Maya Blue on the Toninde Codex that we've already talked about. And there's uses of it on the turquoise mosaic masks that are also from the Mishtek region. Uh, it's used in cent- central Mexico. Uh, I think the reason it's called Maya Blue is because it is a colour that comes to define a lot of Maya artwork at a time when it is considered uh, that the Maya are reaching their apogee in their skills of sort of naturalisation and and use of sophisticated use of colour. So what year is that? Uh, so that is so. There's examples of Maya blue in what they call the pre-classic in inverted commas, which is the about 200 CE uh, for a couple of hundred years. But it's after there is a the Maya have sustained contact with Teotihuacan, which is another civilization from central Mexico, that you start to get uh, you start to see Maya blue on all of a lot of artwork a lot of the artwork that we have extant. And then the apogee that I speak of is what they call the late classic. And that's around 700 to 900 CE. And that's when you see some of the most sophisticated examples of its use, according to contemporary art historians and archaeologists. It's still amazing that the technology of how this pigment was created is is somewhat uncertain, even though scientists have been studying it for decades. But we know that it requires very high temperatures so that water is driven out of these nanochannels of the clay, allowing the indigo in. And this process of recreating ancient technologies is completely fascinating to me and also highlights the parallels that exist between Maya blue and another wondrous pigment of the ancient world, Egyptian blue, this time from the ancient Mediterranean. Although Egyptian blue is very different in composition, its structure is more like a blue glass-like material. The advanced technological processes involved in its manufacture also set it apart in the ancient world. And like Maya blue, it's associated with a civilization at the height of its technological capacity and artistic achievement. Like Maya Blue, the knowledge of how to make Egyptian blue was thought to have been lost, and it wasn't until the 1950s that it was understood again. And so how how is Maya Blue, so-called Maya Blue, made? 
So called Maya Blue <laughs> is a comp- what we call a complex pigment. So it's uh, the reason it's uh, one of the reasons it's famous is it's actually thought to be the fir- the world's first permanent pigment. I uh, it's very resilient to chemical attacks and time. Uh, but it's made so it's made of uh, two components predominantly. Uh, one is a type of white clay which is called paligorskite. Uh, and then the other is the dye component, the colour component, uh, which is uh, indigo-based. Yeah, so it's a Mesoamerica, it's a species endemic to Mesoamerica of indigo. And and so when you combine this specific clay that I'm guessing you can find in, in the Maya region? Uh, so yeah, it's complicated. Again, one of the reasons that Maya Blue, so-called Maya Blue, is of such fascination to archaeologists is because we don't know everything about its fabrication. We don't know everything about its distribution, its production. Uh, those are, you know, sort of the big archaeological questions where, where this is concerned. And there clearly was an enormous amount of variability in the way that Maya Blue was made across Mesoamerica. But the, one of the components I told, that I told you about, the white clay, Palagorskite, there's really only one place it has been shown that it's most likely was an ancient source of Palagorskite. Doesn't mean to say that it was the only source of Palagorskite, but that's we only know one, and it's in Yucatan, the Yucatan Peninsula in the south of Mexico. The indigo, on the other hand, is something that I think would have been endemic to uh, quite a few parts of Mesoamerica, across Mesoamerica, really. Uh, so when you look at things in the Mexico Gallery at the British Museum, for example, or when you look at really any of the remnants of, of Maya Blue on archaeological items, often all the other colours that were used, whether red or green or yellow, have all faded away. And they're often they're made of these organic um, sources. Whereas Maya Blue, because of the relationship between the dye and the clay, is particularly resilient to time and to chemical attacks, bioerosion, etc. And I know that this maybe doesn't, I don't know to whom this might sound interesting, but this, but this is the one of the tenets of fascination of Maya Blue, is chemists have spent decades since the 1960s trying to investigate exactly what it is, what kind of, how much indigo versus clay, how to break the clay when you're with the indigo, what heat um, to, to mix them together, etc. Uh, the pH of the water that you use to, to extract the dye, all of those things have been experimented with in order to try to create the most resistant version of Maya Blue to approximate what the ancient Maya Blue is. But that in itself is a very odd thing because, as I said, original Maya Blue uh, on codex, on wall, paint, on wall painting, on body, on ceramic, whatever it is, was incredibly variable. There are no indigenous records of how to make Maya Blue and it is a pigment that stopped being made very shortly after the conquest. There are some examples um, of its use on decorative arts actually in Cuba right up until the 18th century but um, but no mostly it was it was used by Franciscan missionaries in in Yucatan for blue wall painting in convents but production ceased the indigenous process hasn't been recorded in ethnohistorical documents for example so what that means is that all we really know about how to make Maya blue and when I say we I mean we the academic community is what you can read in these scientific reports. Particularly interesting to me is that both of these once lost ancient pigments is that they now have wonderful contemporary lives. Egyptian blue as a newly discovered material with many applications in the fields of forensics and nanotechnology and Maya blue as a ubiquitous material for the expression of contemporary indigenous artistic sensibilities. In this place... And in this time, no mortal man is higher than the mighty neighboring empire of the Toltecs. Lord for Jawar Quetzalcoatl, the king above the local kings, who were to him but dimly lit beneath his gloriously colored Quetzal wings. So, to arrange a meeting, a deer plays a small king well, complimenting, praising, scurrying amid the yellow grass and brown earth. Ambassadors were met with invitation gained to a ceremonial ball game. All sweat and speed and power. His adversaries were fast, but Lord Adir was faster 
and in winning he made good impressions on the representative of that Quetzalcino, the Toltecs. Lower four, Jawar Quetzalcoatl. Validation won. Support achieved. Alliance writ and gifts of homage. And the throne of the new Hno will be his. It is agreed after a pilgrimage to meet the Quetzalc himself and a ritual. They lure a dear smile now? Not yet. And how about, so you talked a bit about the clay and, and how the place where you get the clay from has, has this historical importance. How about the indigo plant? Well, the indigo plant is something which is used in parts of Mesoamerica, still used for dyeing, mostly textiles. And in Oaxaca, for example, where the codices are from, it's used in parts of Guatemala, though rarely. It stopped being cultivated in the Yucatan Peninsula um, after the Franciscan missionaries stopped using it for their convents, I suppose. Um, so the, where there may no, no longer be cultivation of indigo for the uses of the dye, the indigo is used for other things. So it's used for medicinal purposes. It's used apparently to prevent baldness. Um, it's used for certain things like stomach ailments. Palagorskite, the, the, the white clay that I was talking about, that's also used for medicinal purposes. It's also associated with pottery traditions, which the, of which there still are some in the region. So, so, so all of this knowledge might seem tangential to Maya blue, but are fundamentally at the core of the components that it takes to make it. What I think is particularly interesting is that it was used up until the 1950s and 60s by women to whiten their dresses. So you know how you use uh, like a blue tablet that you put in the washing machine? That's what whitens your clothes. Well, that bit obviously replaced indigo. But what my grandmother still remembers, her mother used to have a little um, piece of cloth with indigo in it. And when she would wash her clothes, she would rub the indigo into the water over the white, over the white dresses. And the, and the water would look slightly blue, very slightly blue. But what it would do, it would, would whiten your sheets and your clothing. And it would come out really, really bright white. So... It's that kind of knowledge around indigo which has lasted until this point and it was only really ultimately cracked by, you know, global commodities relating to house care or whatever. It's really interesting. So although the recipe has been lost, I guess, um, the different ingredients still hold very important cultural meaning to the Maya today. I think, yeah, absolutely, to the, to the, to the Maya of, of Yucatan, certainly. There are a few now um, Maya artists from that region and also from Guatemala, from different parts of the Maya world, who are incorporating Maya blue into their artistic projects. And so it could become, yeah, a different kind of reappropriation of, of, of ancestral material. But the question becomes, will they make their own Maya blue? Will they experiment with their own, with their own source of indigo and, and get Palagorska and make it? Or will they buy it? And will that in some way invigorate the local artistic community in Yucatan in terms of not just people using the Maya blue as a product, not just necessarily using or using some of the products to kind of recreate the blue, you know, as a sort of trend, but also in terms of the agriculturalists who are growing the indigo. So the economy sort of stretches as far as that. And it'll be interesting to see where that goes. What um, Lorena Ancona and Luis May are doing at the moment in Yucatan is that they are experimenting not as chemists and archaeologists, but as artists using indigenous methods to try to make and approximate the brightness of the colour because that's also part of the fascination, right? It's like, yes, it's its permanence. And they are interested in that to a certain extent to try to approximate that kind of uh, resilience as a pigment. But they're also interested in this marvellous colour uh, and, what the, and what the semantic meanings behind that colour are. Like, what did it mean for ancient Maya people? And can it mean something for contemporary Maya people? Definitely. And, and why do you think people are so drawn to the blue? Like in over the years in, in Europe, there's been many famous blues. There's ultramarine blue. There's lapis lazuli from the Middle East. There is Egyptian blue. There is Prussian blue. There's even international climb blue. Like blue has been sort of at the center of a lot of artistic projects in the past. Why, why do you think that is? I really don't know. I would get. I would say that it's a quite a difficult color to to get out of natural pigments. So, like reds and earthy colors and yellows are are somewhat easier to to fabricate. And yes, the indigo color uh, is widespread. Obviously, indigo grows in Africa as well. But I suppose it. I suppose it hasn't been as easy to attain 
uh, as as other colours. When it comes to my this Maya blue, it's not just the it's not just the process and the pigment itself, because actually there's a lot of archaeological literature about the meaning of blue. So, for example, this this is a somewhat esoteric thing, but the directions of the universe. So parts of the way that we conceive the world, according to ancient Mesoamericans, are associated with colours, yellow, red, black, white. And blue is associated with a central place. So a central place is where there is a, a sort of sort of sacred water that connects the world of the living and the world of, of the ancestors, the spiritual worlds. And so blue is about death, but it's also about birth. It's about connection. It's about longevity. It's about time. Uh, it's about centrality and therefore it evokes fertility. It evokes all kinds of things that I suppose are central to some of the mysteries of of the universe as, as we understand it. So I think, yeah, blue has a special a special place in, in my uh, culture. It is time to return to Temple of Death and to the deathly Lady Nine Grass. Her voice of rushing wind over nighttime roofs that once had shattered his heart's hope, that had given him tools to excel at slaughter. The voice that has set him on this route to the throne of Yuphno, to that voice he gives his thanks. And with those thanks, his once true heart now withered and blackened to a little thin, soul bent on power. With loyal low 12 movement, his forever nearby shadow, this soul bent heart returned to conquest. A jewel on his target eye is the fortress of Yukuyo on the hill of the moon. That fortress town belonging, as it does, to his once true love, Lady Six Monkey, and her unsmiling husband. A deer and 12 movement strike. Muscle meets less well trained muscle. Spear tips dip in human ink to write tall red drawings on white stone walls. Yukuyo is his. Eight deer's first strike against his swan's true love. His bleak black heart beats fury. Lord Eight Deer Juggle Claw breathes in the stench of Lady Six Monkey's ravaged town and knows this first blow against his swan's true love will not be the last to fall. And so what do you think is going to be the political significance of using Maya Blue in artwork, for example? Like, do, do you think at some point or do you think it could end up being problematic when contemporary artists who are not Maya um, use the pigment? No, I think that the idea of this color being used outside the region is a really beautiful one. I think that that's not something that people would necessarily have any critique over. But it's true that the important thing is that the in a sense, the the profits and the structures around creating Maya Blue remain in the hands of people locally. And that's what tends to not happen on the basis of the way that people invest in companies and, and patents and projects. And so that's something that I think there's a lot of research going on about how communities can mobilise that kind of ancestral resource for their own benefits and sort of not relinquish those to global capitalism. But we'll see how that goes. I do think it's politically important. I think, I think, uh, which I haven't mentioned before, and I don't know, you know, is that Mexico, everybody hears about Mexico, and Mexico's full of all these beautiful things, like the use of cochineal on, like, natural dyes and crafts and pottery and all kinds of artisanal objects, let's say, because they've been popularised as part of the folkloric art market and there's been a sort of relationship with international collectors on the basis of the construction of the Pan American Highway. Uh, foreign collectors being interested in, in kind of collecting uh, indigenous material. But Yucatan, the peninsula, was sort of left out of that process. And I think it's in part because of its distance from the Pan American Highway. And I think for a lot of other political and kind of administrative reasons. But it means that it's a place where people see that there, as if there isn't some kind of cultural continuity, as if indigenous uh, sort of artistic expression doesn't exist in the region. And it's absolutely not true. It's, there's a lot of indigenous knowledge expressed in oral narratives. There's a lot of indigenous knowledge expressed in rituals and ceremonies. Um, 
But it's true, the textile production, the pottery, etc., it all seems to be, let's say, slight, slightly more affected by European styles. And, I, and so I think that the use of Maya Blue is interesting in kind of countering that stereotype about how it can export its local culture. That's all for this episode. What's coming up next? Hallucinogens. In a part of the Codex, Lord Eight Deer and his brother apply hallucinogenic ointment to their skin before Lord Eight Deer's visit to the Temple of Death. In our next episode, we'll talk about some of the hallucinogenic practices in Mesoamerica. So until next episode. The epic of Lord Eight Deer was read aloud by Miguel Villegas Ventura. This creative reinterpretation, scripted by Jack Monaghan, is based on the Tonintelle and other mystic codices that mention Lord Adir's story. We are particularly indebted to the book, Encounter with the Plum Serpent, Drama and Power in the Heart of Mesoamerica, by Martin Jensen and Gavina Aurora Perez Jimenez, and the play, Recreation of the History Told in the Mystic Codices, by the community theater, Yeonyu Sabi, directed by Maria Ofelia Porras Lescas. This podcast season is made possible by the generosity of Alejandro and Charlotte Santo Domingo and Mrs. Julio Mario Santo Domingo with Andres and Lauren Santo Domingo. If you want to know more about the Santo Domingo Center, please visit SD Cellar website, sdcellarbritishmuseum.org. This podcast was recorded, engineered, and edited by Prong Productions. For more information on Prong, please visit prongproductions.com. That's P-R-O-N-K productions.com. <laughs>